Good afternoon. We'll now begin with the body imaging session. Uh, my name is Sarah Lewis. I'm an assistant professor of radiology here at Mount Sinai. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today our next speaker. Dr. Richard Eman is a professor of radiology at the Mayo Clinic and an emeritus member of the Mayo Clinic Board of Trustees. He did his radiology training in Ottawa, Canada, and his research fellowship at UCSF. Dr. Eman is best known for his groundbreaking work in medical imaging, specifically MRI. He is a pioneer and a driver behind the development of MR elastography, enabling the non-invasive assessment of tissue stiffness. This technology has been applied broadly with a variety of CNS and body applications. This robust research program is focused on developing such new imaging technologies. Dr. Eman holds more than 40 patents, and many of these innovations are widely used in medical care. He is a prolific author with over 600 published articles, books, book chapters, and commentaries. Dr. Eman's work in MRE is especially meaningful to us here at Mount Sinai given that we have a very large and robust liver disease practice. We have started to implement his technologies and innovations with success in our department and much to the excitement of our clinical colleagues. In particular, we're able to provide our hepatologists with important information about liver stiffness and how it relates to tissue fibrosis with the long-term goal of uh, diminishing the need for a percutaneous liver biopsy. MRE is really an important development given these patients need frequent monitoring and given the development and success of current antiviral medical therapies. Dr. Eamon has served as chair of the Radiology and Nuclear Medicine Study Section at the National Institutes of Health and as a member of the Advisory Council of the NIBIB at the NIH and as a member of the Council of Councils at the NIH. Dr. Eamon was awarded the gold medal from the ISMRM and uh, has also received the Outstanding Researcher Award from the RSNA for his contributions. He was elected to the Institutes of Medicine and the National Academies of Science, uh, a very well-deserved honor. Dr. Eamon has served as president of many professional organizations, including the ISMRM, the Academy of Radiology Research, the SBCT MRI, and will be president of the RSA in 2007. Dr. Eamon's contributions to radiology, and specifically MRI, are astonishing. It's an honor to introduce him to speak with us today regarding MRI elastography, a new touch in medical imaging. So please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you for the really extraordinarily kind uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. It's really wonderful to be invited to present at this uh, workshop, at this <laughs> conference, and I'm really looking forward to keeping you awake for the next uh, few minutes, if I can. So with that, let me show you, uh, let's dim, dim the lights, please, and uh, let me show you the, uh, my disclosure. You can take a moment to look at that. And if there are any attorneys in the room, I'd like you to read that carefully, please. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> So this, I'm going to start with this image. This particular uh, painting was called, uh, it's by the artist was Luke Fildes. It's called The Doctor. It was, it was uh, first shown in the late part of the 1800s in the Tate Gallery in London. That's where it is now. And it's been said that this particular painting has had more impact on the Western world's perception of the role of the physician than any other piece of art. I could talk for the whole hour about this particular painting because it was really a remarkable, had a remarkable impact, and it's come back again and again in history since that time. It's been used politically, it's been used by organized medicine, it's been used in all kinds of ways. Uh, the artist was incredibly impressed by uh, the physician that had attended to his son, who unfortunately had died uh, just a few years before this, actually from TB, uh, but had been really impressed with the quiet uh, compassion of the physician who attended to his son. So the title of this is The Doctor, and I often, when I've looked at this painting, I've often thought, well, really, many people say it's about the patient. You can see this child on the makeshift bed, ill. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's this light of dawn that's on the child, and it perhaps signifies that she's going to get better. You can see the parents in the background bereft. But what really, uh, I think, I, when I, what occurs to me when I see this painting is I imagine to myself what's going through the mind of this physician right now. And imagine now that the, you go back to the late 1800s, um, x-rays haven't been developed yet. Uh, there's no uh, antibiotics. The diagnostic testing really doesn't exist in those times. The physician has physical examination, observation, history, and that's about it. And so I, I think to myself, what is he thinking? I, what he's really thinking, I think, is that you know, even if I knew what was wrong, I probably don't have anything I can really do about this other than to comfort this child and hopefully allow her to get better. And the other part is I just really don't have any idea what's wrong here. You know? And I think that was the state of, of, of medicine at that time. 
And of course, we now have incredible diagnostic tools, including imaging, that provide us with incredible information, unbelievable amounts of information about what's going on. We have laboratory testing. We have many other things. But we have these you know, wonderful diagnostic technologies that have revolutionized medicine. Each of them tells us something about uh, the, the anatomy we're looking at, uh, but they don't tell us everything. And so there are some things that even our most remarkably powerful modalities don't provide because they all depict certain tissue properties and there are some tissue properties that they simply can't reveal to us. So here the anatomy is normal and yet there's a terrible abnormality. And the abnormality here is that the liver stiffness is nearly three times normal. Now we can't see it in this conventional MR image because conventional MR image doesn't depict this particular uh, tissue property, the mechanical properties. <laughs> well, that's kind of an odd thing to be talking about, but we know from the experience of a traditional physical medicine that this traditional, a centuries old technique that we call palpation is an incredibly powerful diagnostic tool. And every day physicians will, will with simple touch, will pick up tumors in the thyroid, breast, and prostate that we haven't seen or we haven't first diagnosed with any of our fancy imaging modalities. So we know that this property of tissue must be very important and it would be very nice if we could somehow image it. Many diseases affect tissue stiffness in a profound way. Some of them increase tissue stiffness like cancer and inflammation and some of them decrease tissue stiffness in a profound way. But what I think is also interesting is that over the last several decades, we've learned that this property of tissue stiffness is, has a very important uh, role uh, in many, uh, the development of normal tissues and organs, a uh, control cell growth. This whole science of mechanobiology that's observing now, that, that's emerging now, uh, uh, it tells us a lot about how, how organs form. And it's now understood that abnormal extracellular matrix <laughs> mechanics can have a huge role it may be the primary role in many disease processes. These are all diseases where mechanotransduction, abnormal mechanotransduction, uh, is important. So this is important, and so if you wanted to non-invasively and quantitatively assess the mechanical properties of tissue, and you wanted to do it in an imaging context, it was, it's long been known that one approach that you could do this would be to use shear waves. So if you put mechanical waves into tissue, they propagate in different ways depending on tissue stiffness. They move more rapidly in hard materials and more slowly in soft materials. And if you put in continuous harmonic waves, as you see here, that's reflected in the wavelength. The wavelength is longer in stiff material and shorter in soft material. So that's a simple idea. Let's put mechanical waves into, into the body and then let's image those waves and, see, and, and from the pattern we should be able to mathematically calculate the mechanical properties of tissue. The problem is, of course, that these waves only move the tissue by a tiny f a f amount, f microns or fractions of microns at typical frequencies. So how in the world are we going to image these waves inside the body in the presence of physiologic motion? Well, it turns out, as, as uh, I think Dr. Pettigrew said this morning, that, that uh, MRI and, and many of our imaging modalities are remarkably versatile, and it turns out that a modification of something called phase contrast MRI makes it possible to actually image these waves. And with that, we can then do something that we would call MR elastography. So I'm showing you here a tissue, uh, uh, an image, an actual MR image of a tissue simulating phantom that has some stiff inclusions in it. And then schematically here, I'm showing you how we put mechanical waves into that. And then with that, we then obtain these images. These are snapshots, each obtained in just a few seconds uh, of these waves, actual waves propagating through this gel phantom. And you can see that these waves have very low amplitude. Here, they're actually quite strong. They have amplitudes that are approaching 10 <laughs> microns, but that's still a very, very small uh, uh, dimension, much low, below the, the standard image, image resolution of, of our imaging techniques. Once you have this information, now you can apply mathematics and it turned out that when we started doing this work, the mathematics to do this really didn't exist. And so over the years, uh, we've had to develop 
mathematical algorithms that, based on the wave equation or other t techniques, calculate uh, the stiffness of materials based on this information, producing this final image, which you could call an elastogram, which here shows these two inclusions and that they are stiffer than the surrounding gel material. So that's the basic idea behind MR elastography. And so this is a technique that's main current application, as you'll see, is for assessing liver fibrosis. It's now widely available commercially from uh, different vendors. There's now an installed base in the world of about 500 systems that have this technology available. The acquisition time, as I said, is very quick. It's less than a minute. So the most important application right now, and I'm going to give you a survey of, of where this is being used and the frontiers of this particular work, uh, but the, we need to say a little bit about, about, about uh, liver disease. So it's an important cause of death worldwide. And there's an increasing prevalence of conditions that cause hepatic fibrosis. Uh, hepatitis C uh, affecting about 5 million people in the U.S. and many of them don't know it. Huge number of people globally, hepatitis B. And then this epidemic of obesity and fatty liver disease that now affects one in three Americans. And the important point is that this common endpoint, the condition of fibrosis that can then progress to cirrhosis and then end-stage liver disease, can be reversed and in some cases uh, stopped and in some cases even reversed if we can make the diagnosis while it, before it progresses to irreversible cirrhosis. <laughs> so we want to be diagnose this condition of hepatic fibrosis, which is the response to liver injury, um, before it progresses to irreversible high mortality cirrhosis. And as many of you know, this condition of, of end-stage liver disease is also the setup for primary hepatic malignancy, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a pre-malignant condition as well. Traditionally, the standard way that this diagnosis was made was with a liver biopsy. You take a small specimen of liver tissue, look at it under the microscope, and that's been a standard procedure for ruling out hepatic fibrosis. The trouble is that there's a risk of, of complications. Uh, it's not a very pleasant procedure. It, there is associated with some pain. But also, it's not a very good test because there is a problem with sampling error. If the disease is not homogeneous within the liver, if it's heterogeneous, then that one specimen will be different from another. And there's also a problem with sub subjective histology grading. So we would like to have some non-invasive, reliable, non-invasive ways of making this diagnosis. Well, why would we think about using a technology for, for imaging the mechanical properties of tissue to make this diagnosis? Well, we know that normal liver is one of the softest tissues in the body. And on the other hand, physicians can sometimes palpate the liver as a rock-hard structure in patients who have uh, cirrhosis. So in between, the liver stiffness must increase. And indeed, that's the case. How do we make this work in vivo? Well, it took many years to develop the technology to apply this, these ways reliably in the abdomen, but it's done with a device like you can see here, which is kind of like a little drum that's placed on the abdominal wall. Once we do that, then we can image the waves, and these are actual waves imaged in the, in the abdomen with this uh, phase contrast technique. I'm going to show you a few examples of them, but we don't use those diagnostically because what happens then is once they're acquired in about 15 seconds, the scanner automatically then generates this map, this elastogram, which is the diagnostic image, which is the, which is the image that shows these new biomarkers, uh, which in this case is the complex shear modulus, and I'll talk about that in a little while. So multiple studies have been done now looking at the relationship with the, between the stage of fibrosis as looked at biopsy and liver stiffness. And this is one example of the kind of data. And you can see how as you, as you go to higher levels of liver fibrosis, the stiffness steadily increases. And this then leads to um, uh, the ability to make a diagnosis of liver fibrosis with these. Now I'm showing you 16 examinations here, 16 patients who had MR elastograms. You can see this one here is normal. The liver stiffness here is sort of similar to the subcutaneous fat. This patient with a little bit higher liver stiffness has a, st a stage one fibrosis. This patient <laughs> stage two, stage three, stage four. I just stacked up images, uh, exams by the extent of fibrosis. And you can see how once you get to uh, stage four, cirrhosis, you can see the liver is very, very stiff, eight kilopascals or more here. So here are two patients with chronic liver disease. 
And the question would be, is hepatic fibrosis present? So again, in most people, hepatic fibrosis doesn't cause any anatomic abnormality. So the morphologic imaging techniques available to us wouldn't allow us to determine whether or not either of these patients is getting into trouble. Here are the waves, just for your interest, but here are the elastograms, and you can see that this patient has normal liver stiffness, which is normally about two kilopascals, similar to subcutaneous fat. This patient, on the other hand, has a very high liver stiffness, nearly three times normal, and you can see how uh, the, uh, this uh, patient has advanced liver disease, uh, stage three to, to four. So multiple studies have been done to look at the diagnostic performance of this technique in making this particular, di this particular diagnosis. And uh, this is a meta-analysis of about 14 studies that was published in 2012. And what I'm going to show you here is what's called the area under the ROC curve, which is, as you know, is a standard way we look at the diagnostic performance of a, of a test. And uh, this is for uh, determining stage uh, one or higher, stage two or higher, stage three or higher, stage four or higher. This four, of course, is cirrhosis. And here is a standard clinical index that's used by, by hepatologists uh, as a way of looking at whether or not a patient might have hepatic fibrosis. This is called the AST to platelet ratio index. And you can see that this particular index provides a moderate degree of performance for higher stages of liver fibrosis, but as you go to lower stages of fibrosis, the performance isn't as good. What do these numbers mean? 0.5 means that it's no better than a coin flip in making the diagnosis, and a value of 1 means it's 100% accurate. So here is what they found for MR elastography in this meta-analysis of multiple studies. Very high diagnostic performance. And they concluded that, it, that the MRE is an accurate, non-invasive method for staging hepatic fibrosis. There have been multiple studies. I won't spend time going through these. But now, since that time, uh, in this particular case, pooled analysis, a more, a more complex type of meta-analysis that actually pooled the data, found that MRI has high accuracy for diagnosis of significant advanced fibrosis. And this one here, um, 2014, accurate in predicting advanced fibrosis. So we now have good evidence. The interesting thing about this technology is because it's so rapid, we can include it in an abdominal MRI examination, which is shown schematically here with T2 weighted and so on, different types of pre and post contrast exams. We can include this acquisition in a time when we might be waiting uh, to perform a delayed scan. So wherever you put it, there's going to be very little <laughs> impact on the total exam time. What I think is interesting and exciting is potentially using this very quick examination in a very definitive way without encumbering it with all this other stuff that we may not need, but rather using it as a definitive liver health exam, exam possibly in combination with, a, with a, a very quick sequence to look at fat and iron quantitatively. And so in one exam that might be less than two minutes of imaging time, we could get fat, quantitative fat fraction, an estimate of iron content, and then, an and then an assessment of fibrosis, all in, in an exam that might be accomplished in five minutes on the scanner, 10 minutes of scanner time, and you could call this a hepatogram, perhaps. So I'm very excited about this, and this is where I think we can go in the future. At the Mayo Clinic, we started using this technology in 2007, and we've used it in thousands of exams since that time. The most common indication, actually, is fatty liver disease, which, is, as I said, affects about one-third of the U.S. population. Most people who have fatty liver disease don't get into trouble. They have simple steatosis of the liver. But unfortunately, a small percentage will develop progressive inflammation of the liver, fibrosis, healing response, fibrosis, and eventually end-stage liver disease. And this is so important because it's so common, it's, it's been predicted that about now, that, that in fact, and it seems to be happening, that fatty liver disease-induced liver failure is becoming the most common indication for <laughs> liver transplant in the U.S., so it's a big deal. Here are three patients who have known fatty liver disease. Okay, so one-third of, of this audience here has fatty liver disease, okay? And so here are three of you, and you can see that, uh, and that the anatomy is normal. You can't tell by looking at the liver whether or not these patients are getting into trouble. But let me show you. Can you tell? I don't think you can tell. So this one here is normal. You can see normal liver stiffness. This patient, also normal liver stiffness. Now, you probably know what's coming. This patient who has normal anatomy, it's been amazing to me how many people with completely normal anatomy have advanced disease. You can see this patient has end-stage liver disease already with normal anatomy. And this is very striking. 
We know that about 5 million Americans have, as I said, hep C. So there's a big campaign on. And if you're in the baby boom population, you should be tested for this. It's becoming a very important cause of uh, morbidity and, and mortality. And we now have great drugs to treat it. And here is a patient, 55-year-old, with chronic hep C infection. We know that, they, that about 25% of these people will start developing liver fibrosis and therefore need the treatment. And as you know, the treatment is very expensive, on the order of $100,000 for a 12-week course of therapy that's almost 100% effective in treating the, the condition. This patient here with normal, relatively normal anatomy, very advanced disease, and was put on, on uh, treatment without having to have a biopsy. And because this technique is so rapid and so simple and, and, and uh, easy to do, we can use it to assess whether or not treatment is working. So here's a 60-year-old patient with chronic hep C infection, 2009. This is before we had the really good drugs. This patient had to use the old, we were using the old re regimen of, of interferon and, uh, 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 in this patient. But anyway, at this time, 4.2 kilopascals, very advanced fibrosis. Here we are after several years of therapy, the liver now is much lower in stiffness, almost, it's really within the normal range, almost within the normal range now. <coughs> this is a patient, we know that alcohol uh, abuse will lead to chronic liver disease in some patients. Here's a 76-year-old pa patient who had a real long history of alcohol uh, abuse. And you can see that this patient had very high liver stiffness, 5.5 kilopascals, nearly three times normal, very advanced disease. Interestingly enough, we had a chance to show this patient the damage this was causing, and this patient actually decided to stop drinking. And nine months later, we had a chance to look at the liver again and see what it showed. What do you think it showed? Nine months later, now down to 3.4 kilopascals, almost approaching the range of normal. So this is, I think, a very interesting tool in this way. Here's another very treatable form of liver uh, fibrosis of, of, uh, that could lead to end-stage liver disease in many people, autoimmune hepatitis, treatable with corticosteroids. In 2007, when we, the diagnosis was first made, this patient had 4 kilopascals. Remember, 2 is 2.5, above 2.5 is abnormal. 4 kilopascals, definitely in the abnormal range. Biopsy was done, stage 2 fibrosis, so moderately uh, moderate fibrosis. Here, after a year and a half of treatment, you can see the liver is much less stiff. Now, 2.9 kilopascals and a biopsy was done, the, the fibrosis has resolved. So it's a way now we now have this, this biomarker that allows us to follow the course of this disease. You probably know that there are now some ultrasound-based techniques. Conventional ultrasound is not capable of depicting the mechanical properties of tissue, but there are now some ultrasound shear wave elastography techniques that are available that are also good tools for making this assessment. I'm just going to compare and contrast them a little bit in a moment. Uh, the, one, uh, the waves are either applied externally, as with this device called, elast called transient elastography or fiber scan, or they can be generated internally with acoustic radiation force. Um, and basically what happens is you get the waves into the liver, then you measure their speed with uh, ultrasound-based uh, tracking, and then you can calculate the stiffness based on the wave speed. Um, and you can, I'm going to skip over that. So how do these perform? Well, this is fiber scan. This is the earliest ultrasound-based device for measuring liver stiffness. And you can see its performance is very good at high levels of fibrosis, and it drops off. This is according to a big... Um, uh, 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 meta-analysis that was published in 2008. There are some newer ultrasound-based techniques that are basically <coughs> upgrades to, uh, amp to ultrasound scanners and use acoustic radiation force. They actually perform a little bit better, uh, <coughs> according to the literature, um, uh, at the lower stages of fibrosis. But again, in there, this analysis here, the showing here, again, this meta-analysis, MR elastography seems to have a di higher level of diagnostic performance. Why might that be? Well, I think it comes back to this issue of sampling error. So in fiber scan or other ultrasound-based techniques, you're measuring the stiffness of a spot in space. The fiber scan is not an imaging device. Some of the ultrasound-based elastography techniques are, but they nevertheless don't give you a global view, but rather just a spot measurement. So you're, you're sampling a bigger region than you would be with a biopsy, but this still is, even if you do several measurements, you're still going to have some potential for sampling error. With MR elastography, on the other hand, you can, in principle, evaluate the whole liver 
and you can then look at, uh, you could see how if you made a spot measurement or a biopsy in this region, you would think the patient had very advanced disease. If you made a measurement in this region, you would think that the patient had not very advanced disease. So that's probably why there is this difference in performance. Now, um, we did a study uh, a few years ago to look at patients with fatty liver disease to see how early could we make this diagnosis of steatohepatitis, this combination of inflammation and possibly fibrosis that is the complication of people who have, uh, who, who have uh, simple steatosis. So these were all patients, these are samples, these are, these are examples from a much larger population of patients who all had fatty liver disease. And here I'm showing you their elastograms. And then here is the biopsy findings, which you may or may not be able to read, but I'll go over them. Let's look at these two cases at the low end here. These had normal liver stiffness, and you can see that the, bi the biopsy findings showed no fibrosis and no inflammation. And you can see that, as I say, the stiffness is normal. These patients, on the other hand, had very high liver stiffness. You can see that here. They had both fibrosis and they had inflammation. These patients in the middle they actually had elevated liver stiffness, so it's abnormal MRE. They had no fibrosis. All they had was inflammation. So these are patients in the early stages of this steatohepatitis spectrum, and here we're making this diagnosis before, even before the onset of fibrosis. Now, that's a good thing in this particular case because we would like it to be, we'd like to detect both inflammation and uh, fibrosis. But on the other hand, what if we wanted to tell the difference between them? Could we do that? And that's what I'd like to. Let me give you another example of where something else that increases liver stiffness that's not fibrosis, portal hypertension. Now, how can I say that portal hypertension increases liver stiffness? I'm going to show you an experiment that we did that, uh, sh that illustrates this phenomenon. We took a bunch of patients. Some of them had liver disease, in this case, stage four, <laughs> stage, uh, this is a patient with chronic liver disease, but no liver fibrosis at biopsy, and here's a patient who, had, who is healthy. And we did an MRE on them, and then we immediately gave them a drink of Ensure, a meal, a standardized meal, and 30 minutes later, we scanned them again. We did MRE. We looked at the stiffness of the liver again. All of the people who had no history of liver disease had no change in liver stiffness. Now, that's interesting because after you have a meal, the flow through your gut can double. So that means the flow through your liver, through your portal system, is doubled. And what must be happening in the body, we, we know what happens, is what's called sinusoidal autoregulation. The, the resistance of the, sin, of the sinusoids drops to compensate for the increased flow, and that means that the portal pressure stays constant. And that's a normal physiologic phenomenon that seems to be impaired in people who have liver disease. So you can see this patient developed an increase in liver stiffness after this meal as did this patient. In some cases, there was a 40% increase in liver stiffness after a meal. So, so again, this is an interesting phenomenon. It's probably got interesting implications about who will progress in their liver disease more rapidly, <laughs> invoking mechanobiology uh, here, the stretching of stellate cells, uh, and so on. But what I just want to point out here is, again, here's another thing that affects liver stiffness. So you might say, well, that's good that I can see that. On the other hand, can I tease them apart? So we now know that, there are th that it, there's a long list of things that, in the case of the liver, can affect stiffness. Fibrosis, inflammation, infiltrative processes, microvascular effects, cellular contra contractility. All of these things can increase the stiffness of tissue. So the question would be, can we tease these apart? And the fortunate thing is that these these, th this data set is remarkably versatile. It has a lot of data in it. There's a lot of biomarkers, and in fact, if you go to the theory behind this, and I won't go to it, it turns out there are actually more than 20 different biomarkers we can probably calculate. Think of it like T1 and T2 and proton density. We have 20 things or more that we can dig out of these data if we uh, have a sufficient signal to noise. And let me just give you an example of that. It turns out that the, the shear modulus, the, th the stiffness I've been talking about, is actually a complex quantity. It's got a real part and an imaginary part. Engineers call it the storage modulus and the loss modulus. And one has to do with the loss of energy, and one has to do with the storage of energy. And the, the, those two, the real and imaginary part, have a, a phase angle between them. And I, I guess I'm going to just show you, this, this is a mouse experiment, and I'm going to just explain to you in the next slide what this is really showing you. What happens is that 
here's the, imagine that this is the, the stiffness of the liver without any inflammation and any fibrosis. What seems to happen uh, in people who develop uh, uh, liver uh, inflammation is that initially, when you initially give, develop the inflammation and then the fibrosis, is that this angle here between the real and imaginary part opens up uh, from the baseline when you have pure inflammation. And then as you develop fibrosis and the inflammation subsides, that angle closes down again. So this shows that we have another parameter, this phase angle between the real and imaginary part, which has a really interesting potential for discriminating between uh, inflammation and fibrosis. And let me show you another example of another uh, area where we can use these data by looking at them more closely and, and, uh, and assess the, um, and um, use them to uh, characterize tissue. So this, what this is showing is for different frequencies of applied waves, we can look at the stiffness <coughs> of the, the, the real part and the imaginary part, and they change. The tissue becomes stiffer at higher frequencies of applied shear waves. That in itself is something that's characteristic of that tissue, and that slope changes for different tissues. So here is an example where we're looking at the slope <laughs> of that line here and plotting it here versus portal pressure, and, and this stiffness dispersion in, uh, in, in, uh, in versus portal pressure. And you can see that there is a relationship here between portal pressure and this dispersion. So what this says is if we understand this properly, we may be able to estimate portal pressure from the dispersion of stiffness that we measure. Just an example, just a little look, a little window into that. Okay, where can we go with this? Well, first of all, just let me say that, that we've been fortunate in that all the companies, I have to give them kudos, have, been, have agreed to implement this technology in the same way. They're all using the same hardware, they're all using the same processing technique. This may be one of the, they're reporting the same data, using the same color scale and so on. This may be one of the first MRI-based quantitative biomarkers where we'll have cross-platform comparability, and I'm really excited about that. Now, let me show you, why are we using this fancy color, color scale, right, this glitzy color scale? And, uh, and I, this relates to the, some of the, work, the, the presentation that Dr. Mori gave this morning, which is that we're using this color scale because we're looking at not just the fact that we're producing an image, but we're looking at the, from an engineering standpoint at the whole process of collecting, of generating diagnostic information, and then in the end, ending up with diagnostic information. So when we say, what, why are we using this glitzy color? Well, if you, if you say, well, what's the final product of medical imaging? Is it the image? Is that the final product? Well, it's not. In fact, it has to be interpreted by people, right? So the radiologist has to interpret this. And so that's an important thing that involves perception and involves cognition, right? Seeing what's there and then understanding it. And, and, and we need to look at this, as we develop these new imaging technologies, we need to think about this as part of the system, part of the diagnostic system. Now, this has been studied. There's been a lot of work that's been done in the past, but more recently, not so much. There's a classic experiment called the kundel nodin experiment from 1975. How am I doing time-wise? Very good. I'm okay. Uh, and especially kundel nodin my biggest <laughs> mentor, you know. <laughs> okay. I'm getting close to the end here. But so 1975, they studied, they took radiologists, and they showed them images for 200 milliseconds, a fifth of a second and they saw whether or not they could find the abnormality. And they studied that. So I'm going to get to give you a chance to try it. Did you see the abnormality? So when I show this picture, it's interesting. It's amazing. I show this picture when there are radiologists in the audience. First of all, if it's all non-radiologists, they laugh. And interestingly enough, if, I don't know if there are any radiologists in the audience, but amazingly enough, they see the abnormality. And they can hardly believe it. And, but I'll give you another chance here. Did you see the abnormality? So this is right middle lobe pneumonia. And, and most radiologists will pick this up in, if you show it to them for 200 milliseconds. And the reason they can pick it up is because it's not a perceptual challenge. This is a gross abnormality uh, in the contour of the right heart border. It's more a cognitive t challenge to understand what it means, to know that it's abnormal and to see. So, so, so the, the lesson here is that perception is hard and cognition is something we can learn quickly, or we can deal with quickly. Now, they found that in 200 milliseconds, experienced radiologists identified 70% of these abnormalities. Now, this is the other end of the spectrum, okay? So this is mammography, where the primary challenge is a perceptual challenge, in my opinion. Where is the cancer here? Well, it's here, it's there, right? But you're looking here, it's for a, a, 
a, a vague object against the background of a bunch of vague objects. It's very, very difficult. I have tremendous admiration for people who do mammography. Well, Kundel and Odin looked at this particular um, area. And so they looked at the uh, per diagnostic performance versus the number of cases. So here's the number of cases to the log 10, okay? So here's 100 cases read, 1,000, 10,000 cases. Here's the, here's the diagnostic performance on this axis, okay? So this is a log scale, right? And, and, and here, these are ranked medical students, and these are hugely experienced radiologists. And you can see how there's this steady increase in performance. But it's it's, I find this very depressing, right? 10,000 cases to be able to become, reach the limits of human performance in this area, this is a very, very grim situation because very few radiologists except the most experienced breast radiologists will have read 10,000 cases. So this is a situation where we can see that this perception is very difficult, this perceptual task is very difficult to overcome. And you pro some of you probably have read this book by Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers, and he had this 10,000 hour rule Right? He said that to limit, reach the limits of human performance in almost any activity takes 10,000 hours of practice. Right? And he had many examples. Some of you, uh, were, the one, example I liked was the Beatles. You know, he used the Beatles, and he pointed out that they, you know, we think of them as springing to, uh, you know, fame at that uh, Ed Sullivan show in, in here in New York. Uh, but in fact, uh, they had had incredible uh, experience, lots of experience, because they had spent time before they became famous in Hamburg, Germany. They played over 1,000 gigs in dives there, and they accumulated 10,000 hours of experience. <laughs> and it's interesting, if you look at this diagram and look at these, this limit here and how long it takes to do to read an exam, this turns out to be about 10,000 hours. So again, this is not a very happy situation. So what we need to do is think about, in the case of mammography, think about how can we address this problem of of uh, perception, this challenge of perception. Well, I'm, I'm not in the business of improving mammography. I'm involved in developing another technique. I'm gonna give you here what I call the MRI edition of the kundel nodin experiment. So can you just see, see if you can see that? Did you see the abnormality? Okay, an experienced abdominal radiologist with 10,000 hours of experience, or maybe less, uh, will, would be able to tell you that the, this liver uh, contour looks uh, nodular and abnormal. This patient probably has advanced liver disease. But I'm going to give you now the MRE edition of the kundel nodin experiment, okay? Ready? Did you see the abnormality? <laughs> so again, that's a trivial example, but I think that it shows that we need to think about how we, uh, the whole process, which, ha which includes this pro process of interpretation, and that's why we use this glitzy color scale. <laughs> Here's 20 different exams, and you can instantly see the three patients who have advanced liver disease. Okay, so what are some other potential applications of this? Because, of course, there are many. And, and I'm going to just go give you an, a few examples of where we've been going in the last few years with this. Liver masses, okay? We, in radiology, we love to characterize liver masses. Are they benign? Are they malignant? Well, could we use this biomarker as a way of telling us whether or not masses are benign or malignant? Well, the answer is that, that we're probably there's some potential here that needs to be explored. Here is a study that was published a few years ago. This is the stiffness of, of liver in normal volunteers. And here are a series of patients show, who had different types of benign masses in the liver, hemangiomas, hepatic adenomas, focal nodular hyperplasia. All of these had stiffness values that aren't a whole lot higher than normal liver. And these, on the other hand, are patients who have hepatocellular carcinomas, metastases and cholangiocarcinomas, all much stiffer than normal liver, and in fact, a threshold or cutoff of about five kilopascals neatly divided these populations. Nothing is ever this simple in radiology, so there will no doubt be exceptions in this area, but this is a very powerful dichotomization of this, of this group, and I think it really deserves further exploration. Well, what about using it in the pancreas? <coughs> pancreas is one of the most tough areas because we don't have good bio biomarkers for diagnosing pancreatic disease. And, uh, uh, imaging is important, but it has, li has its limits. It's taken a lot of effort, but just in the last six months or so, or last year or so, we've finally gotten to a point where we can reliably, a lot of engineering had to go into this, where we can reliably get MR elastograms of the, of the pancreas. And here you can see various parts of the normal pancreas. This was published in radial, uh, in um, JMRI uh, by Shi Yu, a uh, 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 radiologist from China who worked in my laboratory. Um, and, uh, and this is the normal, this is the appearance of the normal pancreas, which has a normal stiffness, quite narrow range of 1.2 uh, 
kilopascals. Now I'm just going to show you some other diseases. These are patients who have pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. We know it's a terrible disease that we often only detect very late and too late to, have to do anything effective about it. Here are three different patients with uh, carcinoma in the head, the body, and the tail. You can see that these lesions are all very, very stiff, as you would expect. Okay, let's move on to breast uh, uh, imaging. So we know that we need better tools for breast uh, 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 for, for detecting breast cancer. We have um, sensitivity of, that's very high, but the trouble is that we have uh, problems. Many lesions don't, that light up aren't in fact cancer, and so this in fact is a benign lesion, so our specificity has some limits, and that's been a reason why there's been some uh, lack of use of breast, uh, uh, contrast-enhanced breast MRI for, for breast cancer. Now, so if we could some, do something, here's actually where the cancer is located. So if we could do something to allow us to interrogate these lesions and determine whether or not they're cancer, that might be helpful. And that's the role we think that MR elastography might have. We started this work more than 10 years ago. It's taken a long time to get to the point where we're now ready uh, with the proper sequences and techniques to be able to look at breast lesions in this way and interrogate them. So we're very excited about commencing some, some studies. This is a patient with a known breast cancer. You can see it enhancing here. Here, uh, developing the way to illuminate both breasts with uh, shear waves was the big, big uh, challenge, but we found a way to do that. And here you can see this area, this cancer is very, very stiff. And so, and here's uh, some lesions normal tissues and cancers, and you can see they're much stiffer. So this is going to be something that's kind of wide open for exploration now. Well, what about applying it to the heart? We, well, we can't. We can indeed apply. We can generate mechanical waves in the heart and image them and then invert them using this mathematical technique. And here we see through the cardiac cycle, short axis view of the left ventricle, and you can see how the, 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 the wall of the heart changes its stiffness through the cardiac cycle here. And here are just some examples. Here's a normal uh, a short axis view, and here's a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is just gives you an example of the kinds of things you could potentially explore in this area. Okay, my last thing I'm going to talk about is applying this in the brain, because I th think, in fact, that is now the next established clinical application. It's getting very close to being there, and I'll explain how that is. It took us a long time, again, to figure out how to get the mechanical waves into the head without having to sort of saw a hole in the, in the skull and, and put a driver in contact with the brain. It turns out that we can just vibrate the head ever so slightly with a little pillow-shaped device that can be placed into the head coil. And here you see the waves generated by the, uh, between the, um, <coughs> at the meningeal surface that propagate into the head, and then you can see the, the elastograms that we get. So, it's, we developed this capability. We've been working in other areas, and I'm going to show you some of those other areas. But one of the wonderful things about being involved in the clinical practice and, and, deal, and working with surgeons and other people is they will come to you sometimes with their problems. And so the chair of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic is my next door neighbor. And we were out in the cul-de-sac one day, and he said, Dick, he said, I've been reading about this liver MRE thing you've been doing. He said, I've got this problem with people who have meningiomas. So he said, some of them are very, very stiff. And even if they're in an accessible location, these are benign tumors, as you know, even if they're in an accessible location, if they're very hard, like gristle, they can take hours, 10 to 12 hours of surgery to take out. And he said, on the other hand, some of them are like toothpaste. They're like li they're, 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 uh, liquid. I can remove them with suction. He said, we call those suckable meningiomas. And he said, I wish we could tell beforehand which they were. And I said, well, let's give it a try. The thing is that they can be accessible like that, but they can also be in really remote locations there, like you see here. So, so here we are with two patients. So we, we started this, we tried this. These are two patients with meningiomas. You can see the wave images, but here you can see this one's very stiff. And this one, on the other hand, is softer than normal surrounding brain. So this is now being used routinely at the Mayo Clinic at two of our site, two of our main campuses now for all patients. This is another area where tumor stiffness is very important. Pituitary adenomas, these are often benign tumors. The wonderful thing about these is many of them can be removed with something called transphenoidal surgery. This is so much better than doing a craniotomy and digging down through, past the brain to try to get to this tumor to take it out. These, this can be taken out through the sphenoid bone. This is, patient can go home from hospital the next day after the surgery. The trouble is that in a certain percentage, they, they go in and they find out it's too stiff to get out this way. Then they have to wake the, put the patient's face back together again, wake them up and tell them, and unfortunately, they have to come back on another day for 
surgery this other way. So to know that in advance is, is, would be very helpful. We now can look at the stiffness of these tumors, and this obviously this one is very, very soft. So let me wrap it up. Uh, these are, we're looking at brain tumors, malignant brain tumors. Can we characterize them? You can see these are a series of different types of brain tumors looked at at different frequencies here. And if you look closely at this, you can see that some of them, you know, say the same at different frequencies. This one becomes a lot stiffer at different frequencies. So this is just showing you how we can look at the dispersion of stiffness. And this is a new tissue characterization parameter. Look also here at stiffness versus grade of tumor. The, it's interesting, here's the mean stiffness of the contralateral brain hemisphere. You can see how the stiffness decreases in brain tumors with the, with the degree of, 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 uh, of the grade, which is sort of interesting. Okay, lastly, um, can we use this to characterize neurodegenerative disease? The wonderful thing about being involved in research is that you can make hypothesis and half the time you're wrong. Well, we were wrong in this case. We said, okay, patients who have Alzheimer's disease who have plaque, they surely must have stiffer brains, right? There's all this stiff protein in the brain. They must be getting stiffer. So here's what we found. Here were cognitively normal individuals, and then here were patients in a moment. I'm going to show you patients who had uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and in fact, they had significantly decreased brain stiffness. And what we think is happening is that the neuronal network you know, this poison is killing the neurons, and, and you, if we think of the neuronal network, network in the brain as being the steel skeleton of the brain, the loss of neurons is making the brain softer. Now, that leads to all kinds of interesting hypotheses, and I'm just going to finish with this last slide, and then I'm going to thank you for your attention. So this just shows if, if indeed you can see that in Alzheimer's patients who have lost neurons, uh, what uh, the brain becomes softer. What happens with age? Now, Actually, it's been shown that you don't actually lose a lot of neurons with age, so I'll just tell you that in advance. But do you think that, I mean, do you, what do you think happens with age <coughs> to the brain's stiffness? It decreases. So it's kind of like you're losing neurons, even though the pathologists who, tell, who look at this say that we don't actually lose a lot of neurons. So in fact, here you can see for males, the loss of brain stiffness with age. So we can age your brain uh, based on, on the stiffness of the brain. Now, the last thing I'm going to ask you is, what do you think about the possibility that men and women might differ in this regard? So most of the men in this room already know the terrible truth, right? So here's the data we have for women. On average, women's brain stiffness is 15 years younger than men. So it's very interesting. We, this is really new information. We don't know how to interpret this, what this means. But this goes to show that when you have a new biomarker, you can look at many different new things. So with that, let me just say that this is an example of the patient impact, patient with severe psoriasis. Uh, she's been uh, treated with methotrexate for 15 years. It's known to cause liver fibrosis. So this poor woman <laughs> has had to have a biopsy every two years for the last 15 years. We now have a much better technique to offer her. She has no fibrosis. She's avoided a biopsy. She'll be followed that way in the future. So MR elastography is now available. Um, it's a reliable, less costly alternative to liver biopsy. There are emerging indications to assess clinical progression, regression, and treatment response, and many other applications are being explored. And uh, you can't do work like this without having a fantastic group, and I have a wonderful group that, of people that, have, that I work with. Of course, I've got also wonderful support from the NIH, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Eamon, for that excellent and very exciting talk. On behalf of the uh, Translational Imaging and Molecular Imaging Institute, we'd like to present this to you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to open up uh, the floor for any questions. Microphone. I can repeat it. Wonderful talk. Uh, a, a really intriguing by by the uh, hepatogram. Uh, so so we pro we, uh, probably a, a lot of people know that regarding the liver fat uh, quantification, we know it's kind of uh, the MRI is very precise down to one percent. So everything changed over one percent. We know probably something changes for real. What is in the scenario of MRE side? Uh, especially, I'm think, uh, looking for any studies look at NASH uh, transition, especially in the in the say uh, 
the early fibrous stage, uh, is there is MRE can pick the signal uh, automatically transition from, for example, from F2 back to F1 or? or well, yeah, so, so um, among the non-invasive techniques that we have available, and quite a bit of study has been done on test, retest, repeatability, um, the, the MR technique, this M, it seems to be the most, uh, have the highest test, re, test re, repeatability. So if you want to see a change, a biological change, this is probably the tool to, to use. And um, pharma knows that now, and this is now being used in a number of drug trials where you want to, where you want to detect a change that's occurring biologically, and you don't, we want to use the smallest number of patients possible. I'm hoping I answered your question, but indeed, um, as you go from normal to inflammation, there's an increase in stiffness. We can measure it, and it's quite remark It's quite large. So going from from normal to stage two fibrosis, you're doubling your stiffness, and then you double it again going to the high stage. So so it's a very large dynamic range in stiffness that we're looking at. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And another question is regarding 2D versus 3D MRE. Any comment? Yeah. So this is very interesting. So in order to implement MR elastography in a robust, simple way that the companies could do, we had to put a lot of work into developing a version of MRE that could be where the acquisition could be done with a simple 2D imaging. And the key there was to develop a driver system that generated in the liver a wave field that when you interrogated it in the transverse plane, you would get valid estimates of, liver, uh, of the wavelength. You see, if the waves were oblique to the plane, then, you would, then they would look longer. Even the wavelength would look too long, and you would make uh, the wrong measurement. So in order to get this to, out to patients in the world, we found a way, a trick, if you will, in the liver, which is a large organ, to, to get valid results with a very simple technique, and that's what's out there now. But almost any other application, pancreas, brain, anything else, requires a full 3D version of MRE where we acquire multiple slices and look at the wave field in 3D and actually acquire the motion of particles in X, Y, and Z. So it's a multidimensional acquisition, much more extensive. But fortunately now with modern techniques, we can do it in pretty much the same time as we did the old simple technique. So that's, that's what 3D MRE is all about. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. L last question, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, any application for the renal disease? So re renal disease is very interesting, and in fact, I think you have a protocol that's going to be, uh, I, th I think Dr. Lewis is going to be doing a protocol here, but um, this is a very challenging area because uh, uh, the, the, the perfusion pressure in the kidney has a big impact on stiffness. If you go and <laughs> simply clamp the renal artery, the, 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 the um, kidney becomes soft and, and so you can have a lot of fibrosis there and if you, don't, if you also have a lot of decreased flow, decreased perfusion pressure, you will not see the fibrosis. So we need a way uh, to use these more advanced uh, biomarkers to tease apart the effect of perfusion, the effect of fibrosis and so on and I think that's possible. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dick. Of another fabulous talk. So uh, just for the audience's sake, I've uh, heard Dick give presentations on MR elastography uh, multiple times over the years, and each time I've always learned something new, and today was no uh, exception. Uh, he was introduced as a pioneer in the field, and indeed he is, but for the younger people in the audience who may not know this, he's also the inventor of this technique and technology. Um, and we were proud to have funded this, uh, you know, some years ago. Uh, it's amazing how you continue to push both the understanding of what we're observing with this technique and also the growing uh, list of applications. In that regard, I was re really fascinated by the, the, what I would call the second order um, assessment that you are beginning to explore now by looking at the complex components of the stiffness modulus uh, and, and the list of things that you could begin to uh, decipher from those measures are, are fascinating. I just would not have imagined that. Can you say anything about fundamentally what the real and the imaginary components of this modulus are really responding 
to or, or representing or showing us what's going on to change, to cause the real component to increase, decrease, or the imaginary component to increase and decrease uh, distinctively. Sure. Well, it's, we, and as you would imagine, if we're trying to get the radiology community to accept a number, the thing we don't want to do is start talking about it being imaginary. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, <laughs> and so we are careful with that. But uh, the real part is, is the spring-like behavior. It's the ability to store energy. And the, the imaginary part is, and we just call it imaginary because it affects the motion of something when it's moving most rapidly. So if you think of a pendulum, in a, imagine in a bottle, and you had a pen, and, and the more it, 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 it pulls away from the middle, you know, it, it, put, it's, it stores energy. But now imagine you fill that bottle with syrup, and you try to let this pendulum go back and forth. The place where the force on the, on the object, on the pendulum, is going to be greatest is when it's moving the most rapidly, and that's when it's right in the middle of its, of its trajectory, right? So, so whereas the, the force, uh, the spring-like force is most likely, strongest when it's further dis, furthest displaced, the, uh, the imaginary, the, the, the damping component is biggest when it's at neutral. And this 90 degrees out of phase <laughs> behavior of these two forces on this thing are, are what's described mathematically as real and imaginary. I hope that helps, but that would be one way of describing it. So really, the imaginary component has to do with the damping, um, the viscosity of the material, if you will. And you can calculate viscosity uh, in some cases with this. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I was wondering whether you could comment a little bit more about the findings with regards to the brain and the fact that it gets softer, apparently, <laughs> uh, with, with age. Do you think, uh, firstly, do you have any plans to use other imaging modalities to try and understand what drives the, the change in, in sort of stiffness? And do you think it's related to axonal or myelin changes? that may be driving the, the mechanical properties of the brain as we are going on there? So great question and, and really, a, a re going to be a really interesting thing to study. We have some preliminary evidence. It's, it's, the signal is barely there, but we do believe we're actually seeing increased stiffness where there is increased connectivity. So we, people who have Alzheimer's disease are known to have increased um, pl you know, have plastic plasticity around the resting, some of the resting state network areas. In, so, in our studies, we're seeing increased stiffness in a rim around those areas. And we know that that's where there is some plasticity. The brain is trying to compensate for the loss of neurons <laughs> elsewhere. So we know that loss of neurons, for sure, is causing decreased stiffness. We think that increased connectivity or whatever, whether it's neur neurites or what it, exactly it is that's causing or you know, adhesion molecules or what that's causing the brain to become stiffer. But if we can prove that, that means that we can potentially image plasticity. So I, I'm just really excited about that. And we're working right now on a project where we're, we're using a new type of hardware that will give us much more power, much more powerful signal than we've had in the past. It's a compact 3T magnet that has extraordinary gradient capabilities. And we are going to see if whether or not we can prove that that particular phenomenon occurs. If it does, it'll be very interesting. So thanks for the question. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I just noticed that when you perform MRE, you do it after contrast injection in the liver. Have you compared it to MRE pre-contrast? We have, and you can do it at either, at either time. You can, if you do it after contrast, you get more signal to noise. The uh, contrast material seems to have no impact, uh, has no impact on, on liver stiffness, the, the conventional contrast. Now, throw out a challenge in this room. If you can think of the, what is the material that is the contrast agent for MRE? We don't know, but it probably would be interesting to find one. So thanks for that question. An added question, mm -hmm. even with hepatobiliary contrast or just vascular contrast agent? Yeah, we've seen no, no effect with that. So we don't really know, you know, if you had an, a had an agent that in some way changed water um, content in some way, maybe it was an osmotic agent or something like that, you could imagine that there might be a change in stiffness. I think it's much more likely that you're going to ch change stiffness with some physiologic, and I mean, there's a whole range of things you could study with nicotine, alcohol, you name it, uh, different pressor agents and whatever else. All of this is wide open for exploring. Sure. Okay. 
Fantastic, yes, great presentation. I on, on, was wondering, on the, especially on the pancreas, um, how can you be sure that you get the wave properly in and into, into the pancreas? And is there a way to visualize that? Well, of course, we see the wave, the whole wave field, and we would know if the waves aren't getting into the pancreas because that's what we're doing is we're imaging the waves. But the point you make, I think, or the question you raise is really important. You would think that of, in this technology, which requires putting waves in, imaging these incredibly low amplitude waves, and then the fancy mathematics to try to analyze that, you'd think that the easiest thing would be getting the waves in. Turns out that's usually the biggest challenge and the biggest engineering task, and that's what took us a long time to figure out how to get good waves into the pancreatic region. Partly it involved lowering the frequency. So low, uh, we're going, we go down to 40 hertz for that. Thank you. Thank you again.